So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here once again to the Rise and Learn HR Community of Practice. Uh, we are really delighted that you make time to come here and share and you know, key trends, what's happening, and just getting to hear from your experiences. And thank you for those of you that continue to contribute to this body of knowledge. Um, like I always say, it's your platform. Anytime you want to come and connect and share with us, you're very much welcome to do so. My name is Emily Kamundi Osoro. I lead the team at Rise and Learn. Today we are privileged to have uh, John Fumba, who's not new to this forum. And today he will be sharing with us a topic on rethinking our corporate learning strategies in a disruptive environment. John is my good friend. I have known him for quite a long time. Um, he's one of the HR and, and learning and development experts that uh, I truly, truly respect. And um, I'm really looking forward to what you will be sharing with us today, John. So just allow me to begin with uh, his introduction. For those of you who may not know much about his professional background, he's an experienced uh, head, uh, learning and development expert currently working at Stanbic Bank, Kenya as the head of learning and development. He has great passion for culture transformation in the context of organizational digital and agile transformation. John is a human resources professional with a postgraduate diploma. I had diploma in human resource management. He's a certified HR manager, CHRM, IABFM. John, you'll tell us what that means later. He's a certified balance co-card professional from George Washington University College of Professional Studies and an executive coach with AOEC. He tells me that he's currently uh, taking a program on coaching supervision. So very soon he'll be supervising coaches. Well done on that progress, John. He holds a um, Bachelor of Education degree from Kenyatta University and he's a seasoned L&D practitioner, John. He's still pursuing a master's degree in international business and administration, strategic management from USIU. So I think if there's anything I haven't said, John, you're very much welcome to add in. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and give you a very warm welcome and to everyone else who has joined us once again, thank you. And we look forward to an interactive session. John, over to you now. Ah, thank you so much, Emily. Thank you. I really appreciate that elaborate introduction. So, Tim, I think it's um, it's a pleasure, I think, to join you again. And thank you so much for this platform, Emily. We show up here as people who are learning from each other. So I'm not showing up here really as an expert, but someone who is going to learn also as uh, from others as well, particularly in this area of our corporate learning strategies. We all know our environment is ever-changing. It's now becoming more disruptive after another. Last year, when COVID came, we thought it would be over by September. Well, today it's August, it's still there with us. But COVID is not the only source of disruption. So, so much has happened from the technological point of view. There is a whole pro proliferation of new technologies coming. And what does that mean for organizations in terms of the capabilities of organizations building? What does it mean for us in terms of learning and la corporate learning strategy? In the past, we not paid much attention to learning and training. But today, the success of an organization will, is a function of its learning strategy. We shall see that. And we shall share ideas as we move along. But before we go into that, 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 uh, that hard stuff, I'll just ask the, you people from the audience, do you recognize this bird? Have you seen this bird before? Anybody? You can put it in the chat. What bird is this? Let me give you a hint. It's not very common, and we don't have it in Kenya. But we have it somewhere in Africa. OK, do we have anything in the chat, Emily? Uh, I just said I've never seen it. <laughs> I don't know who All else right. to have Anyone else? Uh, Kiwi? All them say is Kiwi. Oh, but this bag, bag is huge. It's slightly smaller than an ostrich. It's a dodo. <laughs> yes, correct. Oh, yes, Rispa. Correct. Rispa got it. It is a dodo. 
Awesome, awesome. Yes, it is a dodo. You've had the phrase as dead as a dodo. You must have had that dead as dead as a dodo. Why do they say as dead as dodo? Actually, this bird is extinct. How did it become extinct? Well, there are many explanations. But one of the scientific, the popular explanations is that the dodo, which is which was dominant in Mauritius, Mauritius Island, in the east coast, east southeast coast of Africa, vanished after the French explorers went to the island and they found this bird. This bird is just so delicious. It's like eating a giant kukukienyeji. So, and it's not fast, it's slow. So they ate one after another and they enjoyed themselves until they ate the last bird. So that's the traditional thinking around the dodo. But there also other, there's also other scientific explanations that when these explorers went to Mauritius, their ships also came with other rodents and mice and other animals, which invaded the, the, the eggs of the dodo. And today, we don't have any dodo anymore. And that's a sad story. That's why they say, as dead as a dodo. So it's a picture of this, some of the earliest pictures of the dodo. You can see it's a really big bird. And, and probably the Mauritius, um, the country Mauritius has found it useful to have the dodo on their national flag. Because that's the only place they can display the dodo now. It actually doesn't exist. Now, and to just hold that thought of the dodo, all that thought of Mauritius, we shall revisit Mauritius. We shall revisit the Dodo as we move along. Now let's go back to today's agenda. Then. Today's agenda, we we'll start with a poll question. And then we'll talk about what the recent academic writings are saying about learning and why learning is a priority, especially from the major consultancy, uh, major consultancies, the McKinsey's, um, the Deloitte, what are they saying about learning and learning strategies? We'll go into depth into that. Actually, we'll touch on just one. Then we'll talk about, we won't really go into crafting an L and D strategy because we discussed that before. So I'll avoid repeating stuff I've talked about in other presentations in this forum. And then we'll also revisit the 72020 model now that we have a hybrid working model. So some people are working at home, some are working from the, the office. But right now there's a big call Organizations are calling back the employees to the office. What does that mean for learning? Number five, I won't repeat that. We've talked about it in the past, but I'll just highlight some of the key, key, key critical um, digital literacy skills, the LD practitioner of for today needs. So over we begin from the beginning, then the poll question. So I just quickly go to your chat to the chat and say, tell us, does my organization have a clear learning strategy? that is aligned to a business organization's medium and long-term strategic aspirations. So just there indicating the chart, yes. And after yes or no, after yes, indicate whether it's medium-term or long-term strategic aspirations. And we'll follow through. Um, in their quarterly newsletter, July, 2021, McKinsey reported that learning is now a priority. The data they gave is very insightful based on their research that 50, in a survey they conducted, 58% of the responses are, set, are now focusing on closing skills gap. It's a priority. And this is a priority now, ever than before. And then 68 of the companies they interview across the world are engaging in reskilling. And that that's a very big percentage of form. The basis for discussion for the rest of this um, uh, presentation is organizations are now increasingly adopting an employee centric approach. They are focusing on the employee from a holistic point of view, developing the employee from a social, emo emotional, um, and you know, cognitive skills. Now we are going to look at that, but before we look at that, let's just quickly look at generally, what are the conven conventional ways of, you know, formulating L&D strategy? What's the conventional thinking around L&D strategy? Um, if we look at organizations today in Kenya, even across the world, you find that there are three kinds of organizations today. There are those which are focusing on the current business imperatives of 
building resilience in this season of COVID-19 and the, the related macro environmental challenges, and also trying to return profitability. So many are not making as much profit as they did. Some have lost making, some have closed shop. Some are trying to return back to profitability. So what would be the role of learning in this case? Is to align, the conventional thinking says that we should try and align our learning initiatives to support this business initiative of business resilience, return to profitability. So with even our learning metrics, we try to align to the business metrics. So, so in conventional thinking, if this is our business focus, our focus will be on things like, how do we help the business grow the level of revenue? How do we help the business grow the level of, of, of sales? How do we help the business become more operationally efficient? And so on and so forth. It's so much focused on the current time, now, here and now. What can learning now do to fix and solution to some of the business challenges? But the second kind of organization is this, the one which is now digitally transforming. They are looking at their capabilities, their people, their systems, their processes. And they're trying to digitize this in response to the increasingly changing digital landscape. The world is changing and the world is now digital. It's more global and COVID accelerated that. So you find probably organization is not at that level. You've started to you start you've started digital transformation agenda. And so if that is the case, then the focus of L and and L and D strategies will be just that. We'll be having L and D initiatives that will help us to accelerate culture transformation, digital literacy, support the culture, the structural changes within the organization. In such organizations, of course, we know that um, they are changing the organization structure and make it more, more future oriented based on their the, 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 uh, the, the digital aspirations of that particular organization. So many organizations, for instance, are embracing omni channels, they're building omni channels capabilities, others are transitioning to a platform business and so on and so forth. So all, with all that transformation, there are so many bits of pieces moving in the organization and learning plays a critical role in driving that change, driving that digital transformation. So the L&D strategy in, for such, such organization will be, will be to support digital transformation. Then we have those organizations that which are already there now, the digitally mature organizations. Those are the organizations which most of them are platform businesses. They have a data-driven culture. You know, uh, if you look at how the solution for their clients, they're already deploying the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution. For instance, artificial intelligence. They are building customized, um, you know, customized customer journeys, which are informed by client insights. And all that is being driven by artificial intelligence. In terms of their people development strategy, they are still focusing on workforce of the future. A workforce that will lead the innovation of the business so that they still maintain their competitive edge in the industry. So you find that the L&D strategy in such an organization will be so much aligned to, you know, maintaining, maintaining a, um, a culture of continuous innovation in the organization. So how do you just think about your own organization? Are you type one, type two, or type three? So I don't see type three in Kenya, very few, but many are closer to digital maturity than others. But, um, but when we look at other parts of the world, you will see they are digitally mature organizations. Then the organizations which are in both phases, they are transitioning from looking at current business imperatives, and they are looking at digital transformation both at the same time. So learning, industry, learning strategy in, for such organizations will address both pieces of the pie. That's looking at current business, how we can take it forward. At the same time, how can we transition for the future? Now, it's only those organizations who, are, who have invested since 2020 in digital transformation that have emerged stronger than those ones which did not. So the ones which did not invest in digital transformation, um, they, are risk of, they are at risk of becoming a dodo, as dead as a dodo. And those which hesitated and did not start investing on future capabilities are now struggling. They are really, really struggling. So what does all this mean for learning? The fact 
that businesses are transitioning in different ways and have digital transformation, different digital transformation studies. So that's what we shall revisit today and look at how we can address that. So the next thing I look at is what Mackenzie said in their research, that organizations are now reprioritizing learning, corporate learning. And there's been a huge, huge shift from business-centric learning to employee-centric learning. So if you look at my previous slide, this speaks to a business-driven and business-centric learning. And all these strategies are business-centric strategies. So the shift has been to looking more at the employee and then looking at what that will mean for the business and the business strategic aspirations. These are some of the examples of business-centric aspirations, business resilience, growth in sales, client centricity. However, when we do focus on employees, we are looking at the emerging needs of employee. And if you look at our, our journey between 2020 and now, the needs of employees have changed, really. And if you look at the employee journeys and the kind of employee experience they, they, are, they are experiencing right now is really different. And there's need for us to just to focus on, 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 on those emerging needs from a holistic point of view, from a HR, not only a learning point of view, but HR point of view as well. So if I was to illustrate that shift and reprioritizing, uh, sorry, that word, reprioritizing um, business-oriented learning need versus holistic employee-centric needs, I would look at it this way. This was the conventional way of looking at things. We're looking at our alignment, alignment of learning to business strategy. Then we look at some of the performance challenges that we have in the organization. And we deal with those. We put learning interventions in place to deal with those performance challenges, whether they are team level, organization level, individual level. And our training needs assessment will really speak to addressing the performance gaps needs for employees so that they perform better, increase productivity, and take our business forward. And we looked at uh, employee centric learning as just by the way, what else can we do for the employee after taking? care of the upskilling of employees to meet business needs. So that's when now we'd look at personalized learning. We would call it that that's personalized learning. And we look at what else do you need? This We're investing your learning in this business-centric learning initiatives. But anything that you want to do on top of that is purely optional, and it's up to you. But I just want to put it to us today that the changed disruptive environment today requires that we look at things different and that we invert this triangle. And in doing so, we put the employee at the center of everything we do. So we look at employee-centric learning as our top priority. Then others just follow naturally. Do I have data to present to show that this works? Maybe not today, maybe we can look at it another time. But there is merit in following this approach that is totally different from the conventional approach to looking at learning. Now to be an employee centric in your learning strategy, it means really that you really need to understand your employees from a holistic point of view and their needs. So how, how will you do that? How are you going to do that? You need a deep holistic understanding of employee and I would suggest these four steps in understanding your employee. You need to get a lot of data about your employees. You probably need this data, how will you get it from? You'll get it from interviews, focus groups, surveys, internal surveys internally, so that you understand exactly where your employees are right now in this particular season and what we can do to enhance the employee experience. So learning experience will form part and parcel of that enhanced employee experience. Then secondly, I propose that in trying to understand deeper employees, we try and understand the employee journeys. My understanding of employee journey and my in this particular presentation is different from the conventional way of employee journeys. Employee journeys, we look at them as uh, the different touch points of the employee in the organization, right from the time they're onboarded to the time that they're offboarded. In my context, I'm looking at employee journeys here for the purpose of this presentation. As the life of an employee that he lives on a consistently on a daily basis, which has different 
activities right from the time he gets up from bed and uh, to the time he, he uh, to the time he sleeps in, in one particular day it's really important we understand those different touch points because we will be able to unravel the opportunities we can be able to create you know enhance employee experience in those different touch points and then also we can also look at what opportunities what does that mean for us in terms of forming our learning strategies so how does that employee live? Do they exercise? Where do they do? What sport do they do? What do they do for entertainment, for instance? Is it games? If they watch TV, what do they watch? Is it Netflix? What do they, or is it not your world? Or is it documentary? What is their kind of life? That's what I mean by employee journey. So once we understand employee journeys, we'll be able now to put our employees in different types of personas. You'll find that there are certain it for there will be certain patterns regarding different clusters of employees and how they live and how their aspirations and, and then that will in turn inform how you can build a learning approach for each of the personas. So and that will inform that. So for purpose of illustration, say suppose we have three personas, and I believe during COVID, I think we can we can comfortably unravel three personas. I'm not saying this is standard, this is just an example. Uh, based on your own research and your own insights and the, the data you get, you get, you can always do that for your own organization. So for my purposes, I think there are three distinct personas I see around. I'm not talking about Stan Bikia, no, I'm just talking about generally across Kenya, different corporates. You'll find a persona like this, which I call Thriving Tina, married with two children, so a family person. The, how they reacted to COVID-19 is different because already they had a side hustle in which they invested in digital marketing. Now guess what happened during COVID? That, that business would thrive. Now we all know that as Kenyans, we have this habit. It's not actually a habit. It's part and parcel of our life of having a small side business that we run and it brings additional income over and above our employment income. We can't ignore that part of the employee's life if we're looking at it holistically. We can't ignore it because it speaks to the employee's aspirations. It also speaks to how that employee lives and how they invest their time. So in this case, Thriving Tina was running a digital marketing business. Guess what happened? After COVID, many opportunities. People are now selling through digital platforms. And how she's able to, you know, to leverage on that opportunity and digital platforms and make a lot of side money. So for her, she's highly motivated. She only hears about other people becoming broke and having less income, but thriving Tina thrives during this disruptive season. And what's, it's also important as we look at the persona, we look at their learning style. Tina here prefers to learn through digital platforms and uh, through mentoring. Remember the 70-20-10? So the 10% for how to for digital learning platforms and 10, the 20, the, within the 20% from mentorship programs. That's Tina's learning style. And her hobbies, she watches TV a lot, specifically Netflix. We ask ourselves, what does that mean for learning strategies? It means that if Tina, a preference for learning is by digital learning platforms. The learning experience in that digital learning platform has to be so good and so attractive that it will detract Tina from watching Netflix. So Netflix is competing for time with digital learning for in Tina's learning life. So it's her entertainment life is a be her learning life. So we have to have that in mind. And we look at also the performance and productivity. Conventional thinking already looks at that when we are planning the learning journeys for employees. Our current role, maybe she's a HR officer. Our career aspiration, to develop digital marketing capabilities. So when you look at career aspiration, not necessarily in terms of linear career growth, but that it's a role she wants to take in that organization. She just wants the skills. So that those skills, she uses those skills to enhance her business. So that becomes our aspiration. And I think that's a shift we need also right now when we look at employee career aspirations in this disruptive world. 
not in terms of linear career growth, but looking at the capabilities they can build for the future that will help them meet their aspirations. So that's thriving team. Let's look at another possible kind of persona type two. Um, I can't see this one, Emily. Um, maybe you can read for me. D depressed Dave. Thank you. I just wanted to know people are with me also. So depressed Dave, his story is not the same as Tina. He's single. And after COVID, it's had a negative impact on him. Uh, mental um, wellness issues. Uh, uh, he's lost several relatives to COVID-19, not COVID-10, sorry, that was a typo, apologies. And that impacts him negatively. And quite often, we during the COVID season, I saw many organizations roll out employee wellness, you know, mental health programs and uh, employee wellness programs of, of every kind, but they speak differently to different people. What am I saying that is that our learning strategy can be this, it can be same size fit all. It has to speak to the different individual, individualized employee journeys. His preferred learning platform is digital, digital learning platforms, excuse me, and learning on the job. Hobbies, now, depressed Dave is missing, going to the pub with friends, during his pay time. Pubs now close at eight. At one time, they all close all together. And that almost brought his social life to a total end. But because of all these factors, Dave's productivity is low. His current role is a business analyst. And even he's not sure about his, the next career aspiration. He's so preoccupied with, it, with the current day, uh, day challenges. Uh, career aspiration now is not even a priority. So what does that mean in terms when we are building learning strategies? We incorporate the different personas. They must speak to the different personas. If we are to deploy the conventional thinking in our learning strategy, we will look at performance. I say Dave's performance is low. He's bringing less sales. Let's take it for more sales training so that he can bring more sales. So if we ignore all these other factors that speak to Dave, um, that training intervention will not have impact. So we need to have the right career aspirations you know, with Dave so that we understand him better. And also career coaching to help him see the future clearly from an optimistic point of view and ultimately unravel um, a, a career path for himself. Now, notice Dave's, Dave's learning style it's on the job training. When we go through lockdown, how do we deploy on the job training? When some people are working from home, how do we deploy that? We, that's food for thought. We'll look at that just in a very short while. Then we have this third persona, right? Uh, somebody, in the, somebody in the audience, please read persona type three. In different Ian. Thank you, in different Ian. So Ian, this persona is married, no children. And in that marriage, it's, yeah, there are marriage tensions, you know, both of them used to live in the morning, go to work. Now they're both working remotely at home. So there's a lot of conflict in the house and this productivity is going down and it's medium from high to medium. It's affecting. So marriage issues, family issues, not family, but marriage issues are impacting. He loves synchronous learning. Don't ask him to do a course on a digital platform. Ask him to come for a virtual training or a face-to-face -face training. Dave, Dave is happy with that. And he loves to attend in church events and activities. But lately, he has to attend church online because of the COVID restrictions. And sometimes when he does attend, it's within very limited constraints within COVID protocols. He wants to become a pastor, but he's not sure yet. And his current role is a teller in a bank. So how, how now do we um, how do we now bring out the, the best of of, 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 of in different ion? I mean, the in, in different IEM. Pastor and capabilities of a pastor are not among the capabilities that we are building the organization. They don't speak to David's aspiration. But we can meet, uh, they, we can meet, they don't speak to Ian's uh, aspirations, but we can meet Ian uh, in the middle by addressing this aspiration and saying things and, um, saying, and looking at it from this point of view, for instance, that to be a pastor, you still need to be a leader and you still need to build leadership capabilities to achieve that aspiration to become a pastor. 
How do we enable that? If we don't speak to the needs of the different personas and organizations, uh, one, we'll have low engagement levels. Because each time you bring a learning intervention, the employee always asks himself, what is in it for me? If he doesn't speak to him, then um, when you push business-centric, business-driven employee initiatives, the employee becomes detached from them. And sometimes you find that's the reason why some of our learning interventions are not impactful because they don't have the employee at the center of those particular initiatives. They're so business-centric, they forget the employee. So if we try and advance that triangle and start looking at the employee and then looking at that, then that will mean that we will look at we we'll look at our organization in these three stages very differently. And we'll try to align our business-centric aspirations with the employee-centric aspirations, but to the latter taking priority over the former. So if you look at those different personas, for instance, let's take thrive, uh, thriving tenure, for instance. Suppose in your organization, you're building digital capabilities, and this is at the heart of what you're doing right now. So you're having, what does that mean? Lots of digital learning, building digital literacy. My question I'll ask here is this thriving Tina. Is she likely to buy into the, this digital learning campaign in the organization and digital literacy? Remember, her aspiration is to build capabilities for digital marketing. Is she likely to buy in? Most likely, yes. Most likely, yes. So it's very easy to get her on board uh, for, for that campaign. But what do you look at now in different year? All this, he doesn't understand where it fits in his, for him, and he might struggle to get a buy-in for him. Him who wants to be a pastor in the future, and, and this job is just a means to the end. You have to be able to address his you know, long-term need. But then now look at the immediate context of how you can bring him on board to your digital transformation agenda. And then the same applies to the other personas. What I'm trying to, my trying to say here is this, that, that we need to look at our organization strategy, but at the same time, look at our employee-centric and employee experience strategies as an enabler for taking the employees forward. And in doing so, when we fulfill the agenda of the employee, we are most likely to, to fulfill the agenda of the business as well. So I am one of those proponents and uh, supporters of uh, uh, this Virgin um, Atlantic man, uh, Richard Branson, who says that take care of the employees, they'll take care of your clients and your business. I absolutely believe in that. And I think if you go and try this, you will see a very big difference. Now, I just want to throw a few questions as food for thought, not for us to respond right now. And maybe we can discuss this to us the end, Emily. Now, we have now now that dilemma of investing learning for now and versus learning for the future. It's a question, it's food for thought. What should be the ratio learning for now, for now versus learning for the future? Of course, that will depend on where you sit, the organization sits in this digital transformation agenda. But I think learning for the future and building, building future capabilities is not an exception. I mean, it's not, it's not, it should not be, it, it's a must, it's an imperative for all organizations. Then we can also talk about the amount of investment we should make in terms of learning hours by employee, whether it's work or the job, the 70-2010 um, through peers, and through education and classroom and digital learning. What's, what's, what should be the minimum? What's the optimum number of learning hours? Well, if you go and do research, and I invite you to go and do research, you'll find that organizations that successfully navigated this journey, they invested a lot of hours to, to enable digital transformation. So I've seen writings and recommendations of, you know, an employee should have a minimum of three hours, three hours per day. The others which recommend three hours per week, the others which recommend a minimum of 156 hours per year. If you like, you can do the calculation 
and ask yourself, what does that mean in terms of learning this? But I know for sure that if an organization does not invest in learning hours, especially those who speak to digital transformation, if your strategy doesn't speak to that, you are at risk of becoming as dead as a dodo, um, both as an organization and both your learning strategy. Now, I had promised that I'll revisit the Mauritius in the course of this presentation. Now, uh, in another forum that I attended recently, even as I finish, they were actually presenting data on how countries in Africa are investing time for digital literacy, for the digital landscape. We're talking about the digital literacy speaks to, you know, acquainting the employees with the technologies, the fourth, fourth industrial revolution. They might just, you know, bring up the data literacy skills, you know, including emotional intelligence skills, you know, artificial intelligence, them understanding all that, machine learning and all that, and all that. And in short, depending on the organization, whatever content that speaks to helping organizations build keep people capabilities of the future as by a digital transformation strategy. So when I, when I was listening to that data being given for Africa per country, it's interesting that for dig digital literacy skills, Kenya has only 6% penetration rate. So we ask ourselves, what are people doing there? Especially our young people. Are they watching Netflix? What does that mean for our country in terms of digital readiness and taking a future ready Kenya forward? And we have a strategy and a policy at national level that addresses that. Okay, so that was Kenya. A country like Gabon, the statistics said, digital literacy skills penetration is 5%. Next door, Tanzania, 2%. And guess what? Mauritius, the country we started with, where the dodo is dead, maybe it's, at 20, it's the highest in Africa, it's at 24%. Maybe them having a, that dodo, the national flag is not for, you know, it's not just for fun, but maybe it's a lesson plan that actually we can lose what we have if we don't really prepare for the future. Now let's turn to the 70-2010. We've been now in, been bombarded with a situation here in this disruptive macro environment of Several waves, wave after wave um, of, uh, of, of COVID, um, you know, uh, infections and, you know, re, uh, you know, emergence and resurgence of COVID infections. And that informs the measures the government puts in place. And those measures impact our business almost immediately. We find we had wave one, wave two, wave three, wave four. And each time the infections surge and go up, lockdown, there's some partial of lockdown measures and the impact. So that is going to be a, a, a way of life. And the, when COVID just started, we already had this 70-20-10 model. So I'll just project it here on the screen for everybody. Where 70% is on the job learning, 20% learning from others, 10% learning through education, synchronous, synchronous, digital learning and face-to-face -face and class coaching. So without COVID, we had the luxury of doing these things in a conventional way. For instance, so the job learning would take someone else to another country, to another organization for the critical learning experiences that they need to get. It's so straightforward. You want someone to understand how things are done in a digital organization, take them somewhere, Singapore or China or Japan, and they get the experiences they need, they come back. But right now with COVID, is that possible? Job shadowing was not just came naturally, as well as the you know immersions. So how do we do that? Already coaches have reinvented coaching and mentoring and doing it you know, virtually. It used to be face-to-face -face meeting, you make a booking, you agree on a venue, you meet. And the third one, and I'm not giving answers in this particular case. It's just that for maybe in the few minutes we can discuss and just share ideas. How are we actually implementing the 70-2010? Maybe we can discuss in the planet that. How can we do virtual job shadowing, virtual immersions, and you know, apply the 70-2010? So that's food for thought and food and for discussion. 
So I'll finish by saying this. Let's prioritize the leadership and line manager capabilities as a key part of your learning strategy. Because remember those three personas? Who will make learning come to life and who will be able to understand those employees and enhance the employee experience? It's your leaders. So I have a list that share in the presentation of some of that. Now, this last slide I'm putting here is a slide I've shared before. In the view of all this disruptive environment, what are the critical skills for learning practitioners? Since I've discussed this before, I'm just going to highlight one critical skill which I think all LD practitioners right now should have. And that's design thinking capability. It's when you have design thinking skills that you are able to empathize and build learning journeys for the different personas within your organizations, the different personas of employees within your organization. So it's a critical skill to acquire. And I really recommend that last skill. So after that. So thank you so much, Emily. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. And thank you very much, Eva. Wow. Amazing. Did you stop sharing? Maybe you, so that we can see those who are raising questions. John, you never disappoint. I really, really um, enjoy your presentations and your teaching. And I, and I mean that. I have listened to you before severally. You've been on this platform before. Um, I really appreciate you and um, value the contribution that you bring to our community and the passion that you've put into the learning and development space um, with a lot of depth, insight, um, the experience that you bring and, and really the practical examples as well as remaining current and reminding us to be future focused. So thank you so much for that engaging uh, presentation. I loved your storytelling, starting with the dodo, and I was wondering what's with the Mauritian flag, and now I get it. I think just reminding us that um, we shouldn't take it for granted, we shouldn't slow down, we should always continue to innovate so that uh, uh, we don't go extinct like the dodo. So the challenge to us is uh, what are we doing with the changes around us, uh, the challenges that have been posed by the pandemic. Um, we've heard about the different levels of uh, digital you know, transformation and, and where we are as, as a country, in, as, as a continent. Uh, question is, where are you as, as an organization? In which stage are you? And are you, are you addressing your learning and development strategy from an employee centricity approach as opposed to the old thinking of uh, you know, the business centric. We start with the business always, but I think I liked the inversion of the triangle in terms of saying now we need to start the other way around, focusing on the employee needs um, as opposed to where we began in the past. So thank you so much. Just sharing what I had, um, very, very insightful. Um, I now want to just open the floor and John, feel free to engage um, and to the audience. Please ask your questions and share your comments. The screen is very small, so I, I kindly request that you can unmute yourself and speak up so that we can hear you. I, I see a hand. I don't know whose hand this is. That is my hand. Oh, okay, thanks, Ozem. Yeah, um, thank you very much, John, for such a wonderful presentation. I've really uh, appreciated, you know, the way you brought the content. I, I would like to get you, your insights on um, if we are to reprioritize and uh, focus on uh, align uh, employee centric, which are aligns to employees' needs, which are then uh, off the rails in terms of uh, the business needs. How then are we going to convince the business for us to be able to? Grow? Uh, budgets into those kind of um, approaches, which um, have a very long curve of um, uh, what will, benefits that will be realized. How, how do we sell this story uh, to the business? Because the business usually likes to see a straight line and um, bring money into this. This is the value that I'm getting from it. Um, what would you say about that? I think that's a very good question you're asking, very valid. I think this story is not easy to sell to business. That's one point, and that's what you're acknowledging. But 
we can use our nego negotiation and influencing skills, which among the skills for an L&D practitioner to convince them. And but the business will look at, for instance, in driving a client-centric culture, you know, their NPS score, raising their NPS score, reducing client complaints, and so on and so forth. But we don't do that through client, through business-centric uh, um, learning interventions, training them more and more on client-centricity. So imagine you are, you take in different year or depressed David for client-centric training. He has issues in his mind and probably already has the skills, but that kind of training will not move in the needle in terms of doing the kind of business results you expect. So there's a lot of convincing on that and to convince them, I think that's why it's so critical when you show up as LND practitioner, you show up with the relevant data. So you must have data that speaks, look, this is how your employees feeling in this season. This is how they're experiencing. This is how their learning journeys look like. We can't ignore them. We need to address them even as we address the business learning needs. So we're not saying that we do away with business-centric training altogether, but we do it alongside the employee-centric, prioritizing the employee-centric training. So it's like using the example, so that the early example I gave, it's like convincing them like you can raise your NPS score the moment you have engaged your employee engagement score, the other one will just go up automatically. And it's been proven. There's empirical evidence that that always happens. The moment people give their discretionary effort, they're able to do anything for the business. But if you focus on business you forget, and you don't care about the employees, you'll end up, you know, put them in poor performance plans. You will continue replacing employees in your organization. And there'll be high employee turnover and you try and look at better, for better employees and they'll come and go, they'll come and go. So I think the key thing here is this, and the objective of employee centric training is to bring about employee engagement. Let me finish answering your question by saying this, like look at thriving Tina, for instance. She has a high side hustle, which is doing well. Another employee could be having a side hustle, which is not doing well. What's wrong with bringing entrepreneurship skills training in the bank to help people? What, what, what do you have to lose in investing in that? how to help your side hustle to survive a disruptive environment. So when they learn that, they go and apply it, you'll bring back their focus to the business because now the side hustle has taken care of them, the headache has gone and the money is coming in and they're able to give the best for organization. I think that's how I'll go about selling for my, to my organization. Thanks. Thank you, John, for that elaborate answer. Do we have any other question or comments? Yeah. Hi, hi, Emily. Hi, Catherine. It's Catherine. How are you doing all? Um, really spot on. Thank you, John, for a very insightful uh, and engaging uh, presentation. What I'd like to add is that there are factors that really will help us propel our teams to the next level. Uh, and I like also what Ozon has said is how do we how do we sell that to the business? Uh, there could be some quick wheel, wins that I would like to share is that your culture also must be right. For someone to come and tell me that they have a side hustle, um, they, we, we must have that connection. And it's that persona from the interview stage that we trust you. If you have a side hustle that doesn't have any conflict of interest, by all means, please run with it. And I know another organization that really encouraged that because we bring that entrepreneurial spirit and business acumen to the business as well, where they had a day of clinics and saying, I want, I have this side hustle, but I don't know how to craft this tender, this proposal. Had this, uh, they could go to the legal department and ask for biz, for ask for, for, for suggestions on how to do it. They would go to a mentor or a coach and ask, um, for suggestions and of course a coach would bring out different aspects in that area. But what is that people, we must be able to trust our teams for people who want to run a side hustle and be able to support them because they bring that to the business. So internally, how about us starting with small little uh, engagements like what's your hobby? What do you do uh, during your free time? I like to read a book. I like to, I like, nature, you know, and bring those little teams together, organize events around it. And then when we have those 
fun, fun events. We, we back it up by discussing about the business and the need around the business and say, what do you think? Is there something that we can learn about our business in what we are doing? From this book, what are some of the aspects do that our business can be able to position ourselves? What does this teach us? You know, we've gone out for a hike. How does resiliency and bring back to some of our core values in the business? So just starting small and um, start with your department. And when people see that that is happening, the, the movement really follows suit. And then people, the business starts thinking, oh, okay, fine. I'm even able to support that kind of the business. Then you are learning. It's not just the traditional way of learning. We need to be more agile. We need to be more innovative, like John has said, and all of us here. But it starts with us being brave and saying, I want to change the learning narrative in my organization. And this is how I'm going to do it. Thank you. Absolutely. How do you changing the learning narrative? And I think what, what I heard is that it's also our responsibility to do that. Thank you so much, Catherine, for that comment. I'm just looking. Uh, we do have another five minutes. So we don't leave anyone out. Sorry, Emily, if I was to add. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. Ah, Please, okay. go Please go on. No, and add. To add to Catherine's point, which is very awesome. Thank you for sharing that. It's really important that, of course, we have within the compliance guidelines, there's no conflict of interest and all that. And we understand our employee. And the most important thing is to understand the aspirations of the employee and help them become real. And so I, I'm totally aligned with what you said. And I think what you've really said, I like the words you've chosen, you know, changing the learning in, um, uh, narrative. And also the piece around the kind of culture that we need to build because culture is what drives the strategy of the organization and learning has a critical role in building that. Over to you, Emily. I think you have an announcement. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much. Actually, um, just what I'm showing on the screen, we are hoping to bring John with us in the next uh, symposium. We, this is part of the conversation we would like to extend. Hopefully uh, we can have John and many other um, experts in the l and space, as well as uh, general HR to our symposium that is coming up. You are welcome to be part of it uh, from October the 6th to the 8th. So that's the announcement I wanted to make to the team. Uh, if you'd like more information, feel free to reach out to us. I just want to take this opportunity to thank you, John, so much for always contributing so richly to our community. Uh, we, we save all this information on the online platform. Feel free to access them there. We will share the link so you can join and access these recordings and other past, uh, past events that we have had on our Rise and Learn community of practice online. I want to thank you so much for your patience, for your time. You have been an amazing audience. Thank you for your engagement. John, I want to hand it over to you to close the session. Uh, thank you so much, Emily. And let's continue learning from one another. And thank you so much. Like I said, I don't have a monopoly of learning. Thank you so much, Emily, for that. Thanks. So we look forward to seeing you in other engagements. Thank you so much, everyone. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a lovely, lovely weekend. Thank you, Emily. I can't wait for the conference. I'm looking forward. <laughs> nice. Yeah.